Hi everyone, nice to see you. Yeah. See you all. Um, I wanted to just expand a little on that um, small piece I sent out about the mundane and the sacred. Um, I've got a few other things to say as well, but just on, on that, I don't know whether you all, 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 all of you read it, um, but I'll assume you have, how's that? <laughs> It's, uh, I was saying, Suzanne, it's strange how synchronistic these things are because I wrote this piece and then I don't know if anybody saw the programme on um, BBC4 about still life painting. Anybody see the programme on still life saw painting? Part. I saw it part. Just a little tiny bit of it, yeah. And it was fascinating because, well, it was fascinating for me because still life painting was, was, was uh, reputable and, and, and quite common in Roman times. But then it completely died out once the Catholic Church became the kind of uh, the only commissioner, if you like, of art for about a thousand years, uh, because art was supposed to uh, glorify God or, or, or the Lord, or you know, its intention wasn't to glorify the mundane at all. And of course, still life painting, at its best, is absolutely glorifies the mundane. You know, it's just placing a small apple or something else on the table. And, and, and the best artists, I think anyway, really show the, the dustness of the thing, you know, the dustness of an apple or the dustness of an orange or whatever. The, the, when you really look close, they look alive, you know, they're inanimate objects, they look really alive. And, um, and it, it made me realise how difficult it, for, it is in, this, in our culture, in Western culture, to really appreciate the mundane. Uh, and now it's difficult to appreciate just being an ordinary Joe Blog in the street type person, you know, which is the mundane. And yet, uh, billions of us throughout history, throughout space and time, to use end terms, we've all just led ordinary lives, you know. Most of us spend our lives doing ordinary things. We're not special. We don't do extravagant, wonderful things. We just do ordinary stuff like pay the bills and catch the bus and, you know, <laughs> make dinner. Uh, and so it seems crazy, in a way, not to really appreciate that. Because that is the true manifestation of, of our lives and of, and of, and of, of essential nature. Uh, but it's really easy to overlook, you know, and I find it really tricky. I find it tough as well to, to kind of bring freshness to bear into how I see my life and how I see the daily, the daily panorama of, of life, you know, just in the city or on the motorway or whatever. And yet, for most of us, that's most of our lives. And so if we deny that as being sacred, then we're really limiting to a small preconceived idea of what the holy or the sacred is or, or, or the spiritual to something that's like, you know, when we're, when we're here or when we're on retreat or when we have a big experience, all these kind of things, you know, and yeah, this is our real life for most of us. And I suspect as well, you know, for all the folk that seem to be lead gilded lives and special lives, it's just the same for them. They still have to get washed, they still have to go to the toilet, they still have to negotiate with their partner, they still have to bring up their kids, they have to deal with teenagers, they still have to do all the same stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I just really wanted us to be to 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 to, uh, to to not make a separation anyway, not make a separation between our ordinary life, our ordinary everyday life, and and the life of uh, of, of Buddha nature, of our of our spiritual life. Uh, And yet, West, the Western tradition, from you know, in the, I didn't know this myself, but even in Greek times, Pliny was writing about how still life was the work of a, a lesser skilled artist. <laughs> so, and then, and then, and then, you know, 
the, uh, I was listening to the radio and there was a piece about um, who's just died. Jo uh, what, what was the name of that author, Susie? I was talking about. Uh, he's just oh, died. Herbert. No. John. John Updike. John Updike's an amazing writer, wonderful writer, but in America he never got any credit because he used to write about small town things. You know, he didn't write about great themes, he didn't write about the great life, about wonderful achievements of people. He wrote about the ordinary every day. And it's only just about now that he's been respected as a good writer. So, you know, we live in a culture in which the ordinary is definitely downplayed. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm not in any way, because it's got its own problems and its own issues, but Chinese and Japanese culture have not had this perspective. I mean, you know, within Zen we talk about the <coughs> ultimate practice is drawing water and chopping wood. Can't get more mundane than that. And in the 90s, I think, a, pa a, a painter, in the, a painter almost reaching 100 was made a national treasure in Japan. And all he painted all his life was bamboo. <laughs> it's all he painted. So we can find specialness in our ordinary lives. Um, and w w on that theme, something that I also wanted to talk about was how, 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 do we, um, how do we address the paradox in this practice in which, in a way, when we start practice, our intention <coughs> We have a direction, I think most of us have a, have a hope and an intention and a direction of where the practice will take us. And that's perfectly valid, you know, and, and traditionally practice is seen as a kind of journey. But, in the same way that, that, that being focused on kind of the spiritual or the holy life, we can, we can miss or uh, the reality of our daily lives by thinking about the practice in a way that has a direction, that has an end, that has a point. <clears throat> that can also be another way of postponing being in your life. You know, it's another deferment. It's another, you're deferring being now. You're deferring being in the present moment of your life. You know, and the great benefit of deferring being in the present moment of your life is that you don't have to deal with your stuff. <laughs> you can keep putting it off, you know. So when, when you lose that, when, you, when, when you're left bewildered and, and apparently in a desert, in a no place of nowhere to go and, you know, this practice is not working or I've got to strive, I've got to do it harder. What you're doing is, is postponing or replacing the opportunity to really feel what it is that is your ordinary life. The, you know, all the habitual patterns, all the habitual concepts, all the habitual tendencies, we just keep not feeling them. And by not feeling them, we, we, we don't deal with them. And if we don't deal with them, we stay in the same habitual way of thinking about the world, i.e. we respond to situations out of our memory, out of our conditioning, out of our habitual responses, and we don't change. And we can go to our grave in the same way, you know. So, dro dropping the direction, dropping the aspiration to being holy, as it were, faces us, faces us with our conditioned tendencies. I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have an intention and a direction because, you know, we all need some kind of motivation and anyway, this practice is definitely incremental. It definitely, you know, works better the more we do it, like any practice. But, also, We need to be really aware um, of, of the habitual way we respond to life and of our habitual tendencies because if we're not aware and we don't change, I mean, and maybe that's okay, you know, maybe you feel okay with that, 
you don't feel that feels okay for you and if it does then fine you know but I think from from and I don't I'm not saying fine in any contemptuous way I, I mean I really mean fine you know if you feel okay with it great whatever gets you by you know in a way whatever gets you by I'm I'm behind you whatever gets you by but if you really if you if each of us is to find some uh, wholeness in our lives where we don't feel this gap, which has always been my struggle, then we do need to tackle these things. Because otherwise it just carries on until there's a crisis, you know, and then we have to deal with it. And then, I'm, I, you know, we're less, we're kind of less, less, uh, less experience of dealing with it until we leave, we leave it to the last thing. You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm really, really aware of this now because, not uniquely, because I know all of us have dealt with dying parents, relatives, grandmothers, somebody dying in our life, you know. And what I see is that life is ruthless, you know. We reap what we sow. You know, however we've been in our life is how we are when, we, when we're at the end. So it's really worth getting a grip early on, I <laughs> Because, you know, it's no good from your deathbed taking off, got changed now. <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I don't want to sound too serious about it all, but... I really want us in, I, I really think that lay practice, I'm more and more saying, and, and, and this is not denying in any way the value and, you know, intensity of full-time practice, but lay practice really gives us a, a right in our face opportunity to look at, to look at things, you know, because we're really being faced with it. It's a tougher practice. Because you, you, you're being faced you know, on a daily basis with more stuff and you've got less time to process it because you're not practicing as much. So it is, a, it is a more difficult route. But it's a bit like, you know, and I haven't mastered this yet, but it's a bit like, you know, the saying, if you can be at home in the town you were born, or if you can feel free in the town you were born, you can feel free anywhere. And I think that's really true, and I struggle with that. And equally, if you can feel free with all your own stuff, you can feel really free. But you have to, uh, you have to let it in. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I just, it's, you know, I, I'm going to finish now. But just, you know, this it, within the Zen tradition, and certainly within my background, because I did, you know, I was trained in martial arts in Japan, and you know, this, and then into Zen, and there's this whole samurai ethic, you know, around this practice. And yet, the samurai ethic, or you know, and it's also within in, in Greek myth. You know, you go, you have to go under, you have to go to the underworld and fight all the demons and all the gods. You know, so it's it's a it's a journey for a warrior. But in fact, for me, being a warrior is being prepared to be directionless, to to not, you know, to be exactly where you are now, not to imagine you're on some brave journey, but to be present to where you are now. That seems to me to be more require more warrior spirit. It certainly does for me. <laughs> you know, I can go up and down Dale for all you know all day if you want me to. <laughs> but maybe stay in one spot, <laughs> and I'm screaming blue murder. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, 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 anybody, any comment or about your own life or experience? Or? I was just going to say, you know, about loneliness. It's something that society just doesn't want you to value. Though, no, it? no. It's always projecting you into the next moment's always going to be better than yeah. this, which is what drives our consumer exactly. society. Exactly. It's about consumption, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's frowned on. Yeah. If you if you want to 
say the ordinary path. So yeah. it's, it's that's why. Yeah. It can relate to what you're saying. You categorised as a sandal wearing C two V driving musically eating Guardian reader. <laughs> 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 if you don't consume, yeah. <laughs> you said earlier when you can be free with your own stuff. Yeah. What what exactly do you mean by? I mean, whether you can embrace your own life, mm. really embrace it without feeling that set, you know that little niggling yeah. separation that is quite not quite right. And maybe, you know, somebody over there has got it right, or if I went there it would be right, so... I think then you're free. Yeah. I think it's uh, interesting what you said in relation to, to practice, how even in practice, uh, you know, you, you, your, your stuff can get projected into that as well, to mm. say what, what, what I also have to do more of. Where, where should, I, should I go next? Yeah. You know, which is a, again a sort of consumerism, isn't it? It's, it's like give me more of that sort of stuff. But um, in a way, the flip of it seems to be like dealing with your own stuff seems to be for me. Um, what is it I'm not giving up? It, you know, what am I actually attached to that I can't even see mm. that causes the same pattern to be repeated yeah. every day? Every yeah. Day. Yeah. Um, that's much more, in a way that's much more difficult to see because it's, it it's sort of right there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you've got to sort of step back and stop doing stuff to actually yeah. see it working. Yeah. It's the golden grail when you can find your own blind spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to really. Yeah. You don't want to. No. Somebody that. probably has to tell you, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll fight them when they do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was it you, Miranda, was talking about the balloon? Yeah. yeah. Miranda was talking just about this. So tell us you're on the joke. Um, it's a lovely cartoon of a little person holding a blue balloon very tightly. And it says, um, the reason we're not happy is because we don't want to let go of the things that make us sad. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I wish you and encourage you a good 2014 practice year. <laughs> and I hope that you'll support me with mine as well. Okay.